Coming up on this week's show, a bullfrog classic makes its way to the Commodore 64. One of the 90s coolest gaming characters is back. And we get the story of the first cyber cafe with Eva Pasco. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of my favourite books that they've released in recent years is Commodore 64, a visual compendium celebrating the best-selling home computer of the 80s with some incredible games really bringing them to life in all of their glorious 16-colour grandeur. You can check that out and the rest of their retro gaming collection at bitmapbooks.com. And with PCBWay. Now, if you're working on a retro project right now, you know they're big supporters of the retro community and they offer so many services that could help you out, including custom PCB prototyping with low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards and they offer 3D printing and injection moulding. So get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 387, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And very nice to have you joining us for this week's show, of course, the podcast that every Friday takes you back to the classic age of video games and explores vintage technology as well. Basically, if you know this sound, (laughs) you'll be very at home here. (laughs) Was that ICQ? It was lemmings. <laughs> you didn't know it, Ravi. Oh, was it ICQ? I thought it was lemmings. That was no, ICQ. No, ICQ, oh, yeah. I like this no, game. ICQ. <laughs> ICQ. Well, that was a... Did you ever use ICQ back in the day, you guys? Oh, yeah. I, I lived on ICQ. Um, it had this great feature of when you didn't have any internet friends, you could actually find a friend locally and yeah. um, suddenly join. And yeah, ICQ was actually... Um, one of the really early messaging services that worked really well, um, you know, after IRC, of course. I was trying to think of my number because they were quite cryptic. I think it was like 195-84496 might have been my ICQ number. I did try to look it up earlier, but I think it's taken by some guy in Moscow now. (laughs) I think ICQ is actually owned by some like Russian company these days. But interestingly, you know, Threads, that is obviously the hottest social media platform right now, um, which we are on, if you're on there actually, search Retro Hour, we're on there. Um, That also uses a similar kind of numbering scheme as well. So, you know, what goes around comes around. Bit of legacy. Interesting. Well, interesting you mentioned that, though, Joe, about that sound, sounding a bit like lemmings. I always thought, and this was a rumour that was kind of passed around my friends, that that sound effect, the... (coughs) was actually lifted from worms. Yeah, no. Is it, oh, no, in lemmings or worms? I did did some digging. This this is a sound from worms. Oh, no. (coughs) Oh, no is lemmings. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that definitely sounds a bit wormy. Uh, That's quite similar, though, isn't it? Yeah. (coughs) Yeah, yeah it but apparently not ripped off worms, but just, you know, a, uh, a creepy coincidence. <laughs> but actually today, if you do remember the days of ICQ, I've got a feeling you're going to enjoy this week's episode because we're going to be going back to the days of cyber cafes. Now, that's definitely something from the 90s, isn't it? You don't see many cyber cafes around these days. No, it's, it's, it's weird because they were like really cool and quite edgy back then, you know, cyber cafes in like 94 and 96. And uh, they also had oxygen bars as well. <laughs> Remember that was one thing, you know, uh, you could breathe oxygen and then go and uh, go on this new thing called the internet. And um, this week's interview, oh man, I absolutely loved it. It's uh, with the founder of Siberia, um, Eva Pasco. And um, Siberia was one of the first internet cafes in London. And it was the first. It was the first, yeah. And it ended yeah. up going abroad. So um, it expanded to uh, Manchester, Edinburgh, Dublin, Rotterdam, Bangkok, Benil- Manila, uh, Tokyo, and Paris. And then, of course, after that, there were a lot of copies of these uh, cyber cafes, and over 200 opened up around the world. Because I remember even in, I lived in Darlington in the Northeast, you know, a small little town up in County Durham. And I remember an internet cafe opening above a hairdresser's in around 95 and I remember going in there and I think it was that kind of that marriage of basically you know having a cup of coffee sitting down in a social space and uh, having someone who would teach you how to use the internet because that's something that we take for granted today anyone can sit down in front of a web browser and know how it works but back then I guess having a real in real person place where you could go and have someone actually teach you how this new technology worked was definitely something that was worthwhile having. Yeah, it makes me think, you know, maybe virtual reality cafes would be uh, something that they could kind of have nowadays. 
Uh, or AI cafes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's something that um, Eva talks to us about now. Siberia, if you're not familiar with it, I mean, it was massive back in the 90s. It got, you know, coverage on television. I remember reading about it in magazines like um, .NET magazine, seeing it on, you know, the BBC. It was a load of coverage in Edge magazine. They did a feature on it as well. And it started in September 94 as a straight-up internet cafe. And obviously, you know, we talked to Eva about all the, the issues of setting up something that was so new then. I mean, even having, you know, dedicated dial-up internet connections was something new yeah, then, you know, yeah. that they had to have them always on. And also, it became a bit of a kind of essential hub for creatives in London. And a lot of celebrities got involved as well. I mean, Kylie Minogue was often in there. David Bowie, he performed with his uh, Bowie net, and he was quite early to the internet, having his own website in around 94, 95. And uh, Mick Jagger used to do stuff there as well. So, and also that they rapidly expanded, launched their own record label, and some of the technology that they implemented, uh, you know, using MP3 and um, digital rights management, is stuff that, you know, really wasn't mainstream for another couple of decades. Yeah, it when. had this uh, kind of philosophy that you had to do it yourself, you know, no one else yeah. was doing it, so they kind of did it themselves. And that philosophy kind of went quite a lot with British companies and British computing back, back in the days, you know, when you had like Lions T, who made the automated office with a Leo, it, it kind of reminded me of that. And one of the things I loved about it was uh, she mentioned the post-rave Sunday morning breakfast club, yeah. which was uh, <laughs> people coming from clubbing and then going, let's go on the internet, yeah, <laughs> like on a Sunday morning and uh, a lot of ravers about. And uh, I can imagine that was quite interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and as the 90s went on, I mean, they converted the basement into something called Sub-Siberia. And, you know, that was a dedicated gamer space where you did the do online gaming and LAN parties. And Richard Bartle used to hang around in there quite a lot, you know, one of our previous guests. So really interesting. And not only is it great to get a little insight into kind of those early days of the internet, but also kind of the foundation of, you know, online gaming. And just it was such an interesting era and technology was moving so quickly in that time as well. So um, Eva's done so much as well in the online space. So it's going to be a really interesting chat with this week's special guest going inside the world of cyber cafes, possibly the first cyber cafe as well, because you did ask her, didn't you, if it was kind of inspired by cyber cafes in like San Francisco or California. And she actually thinks that Siberia was ahead of those. Yeah. She based the idea on Siberia. Which is, so. which is pretty amazing because like some of the only cyber cafes I've been to have been in developing countries or yeah. places where, you know, people don't have access to the machines nowadays, but they are, they are still around. Yeah, it's going to be a really interesting chat with Eva Pasco, our special guest. She'll be coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, of course, before we bring you a guest, the first half of the podcast is all about bringing you up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro gaming and technology from over the last seven days. And that someone from back in the 90s has made a comeback. Lock and load, little lizard. Gex is back. Gex is back. <laughs> back again. <laughs> Not only is Gex, there's a lot of people back, to be honest. But mm. um, yeah, Gex, man. So um, earlier this week, Limited Run had a, uh, so you know Limited Run Games who do the, they do the Limited Run Games. They do like the physical copies of um, games. They re-release a lot of like 80s and 90s games or games that come out digital only and then they release them, you know, physically like 2000. Yeah, they're minutes. all about the physical, aren't they? They're all about the physical, most often on the Switch, sometimes on PlayStation, sometimes on Xbox as well. But they had a showcase earlier this week for like what's coming in 2023 for them. And they've announced 25 games. Um, and there's some really interesting, you know, games in there. And the one that's kind of got our attention is the Gex trilogy. So, you know, I know you, you're not too familiar with Gex, are you, Ravi? But it has the original th three Gex games on there, which I think were uh, just Gex, Gex 3D, and then Gex, is it Deep Cover into the Gecko, is it called? I think it is. He was on the 3DO, wasn't he? Yes. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, he's a very early kind of a character but also had this whole fake golden eye kind of yeah James bond thing going on i remember <laughs> yeah yeah he did um i i'm i had gex 3d for the n64 i've since got the original gex which came out on sega saturn and playstation after it kind of flopped on the 3do never played the third one which is the the james bond one you know the kind of gex i think it's called undercover gecko or some, something like that 
But yeah, this is coming out on all platforms from Limited Run, so it's going to get digital releases as well as a physical Switch release by the looks of things. Just in 2023, it says at the moment. Well, if it's... um, I'm going to tell a right dad joke. <laughs> Here we go. If, if it's physical, then you can get Gex at sex, can't you? <laughs> get Gex at CEX, yeah, maybe. Yeah, really, really excited for this one just to kind of revisit those games and you know see how they've held up or if they're as bad as people say they are. But like I say... See, weirdly, you say you say that as bad as people say they are. I did see a list, actually, and I'll link up the article on uh, retrododo.com. Mm. They actually put Gex in their top 20 PlayStation 1 games of all time. Oh, there you go. I mean, yeah. I'm not too familiar with the original one. Gex 3D, it held my attention. I played it quite a lot for the N64, but I see a lot of people hate on it online. Don't see too much love for it, but um, definitely one I'm going to be playing. But... Like I say, one one of 25 games announced. So I'm not going to sit here and list all 25. Um, but are you a big pl- fan of Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, Dan? <laughs> I heard this game is uh, coming back again. It's interesting because I saw this all over Twitter last week. And obviously, I wasn't familiar with that game originally till AVGN's video, mm. which I think introduced a lot of people to it. It was a, uh, I mean, it wasn't even an FMV game. It was still images, it was wasn't still it, images, on the, yeah. uh, the Philips CDI basically a you know a, an early adult game yeah. very very nav acting in it as well but it looks like they're going to be giving this kind of the full kind of remaster and th- the treatment where they've got the original cast back as well for interviews yeah which looks very cool it, d- it does look interesting to say the least and i think avgn kind of put it on the map but yeah it's going to be the definitive edition as you say so it's going to have all the bonus material in there as well jurassic park classic collection which we covered a few months ago that that had been announced this is going to be coming through limited run it's officially been announced now because it was just a teaser previously wasn't it um mm. it's going to have all the nintendo jurassic parks on now unfortunately not the sega ones um and, another uh, one the roller coaster tycoon looks good yeah uh, yeah roller yeah. coaster tycoon free complete edition for the switch come in and then tomba aka tomby for those of us in europe i'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with that but it's the little pink haired 2D game for PlayStation 1. I never played that, but you got quite excited when that was announced. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. That something you used to play? Yeah, something I used to play a lot of. Um, really, really expensive game now to get on PlayStation. There's two of them, Tomba 1 and 2. I keep calling it Tomby because of it was called Tomby in the UK, but it is Tomba everywhere else. Excited to see that one coming back. And then also Clock Tower, um, which was a Super Nintendo slash PlayStation um, survival horror point and click game which got a really limited Western release, um, but was big in Japan. And a lot of people say it's kind of like one of the kind of predecessors to Resident Evil, kind of came out around the same time as Alone in the Dark, but it's a 2D game. Um, Really excited to see that one get in a release as well. So, And a lot of these games are being worked on by our friend Modern Vintage Gamer. Um, He's been involved in, in kind of like porting and upscaling a lot of these games, which is really cool as well. I like it when they pick... Games that are not all that obvious as well. Mm. Limited Run do that quite a lot. These kind of niche games yeah. that a lot of people have forgotten about. I mean, there's not many companies that would have the, uh, if excuse upon the balls, to put out um, Plumbers Don't Wear yeah. Ties, yeah. definitive edition of that. So, uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting to see. Probably not a game that I'd like to sit down and play, but I think having the backstory and the, the interviews and stuff. You're so yeah. going to get it, aren't on you, the- Dan? One hundred percent. I'm still kicking myself that last year when we were in Norway, I didn't buy the ultimate edition of Night Trap for the Nintendo yeah. Switch. Do you yeah. remember? I went back yeah. and nearly bought it, and then someone else picked it up. Yeah, and then you all sat at our table and you saw him walking around with it was under his arm. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like seventy euros or something. Yeah, so, uh, it was big as well. It was yeah. a big, big cardboard box PC version, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I will be picking it up, no doubt. So very cool. And, uh, you know, I'm loving the work that Limited Run do. So uh, keep bringing us these uh, these forgotten classics. <laughs> Some of them are classics anyway. So if you want to check that out and the uh, rest of the stories, of course, I'll put those in our show notes. You don't have to Google around. i put them all in the podcast app or head to our website at theretrohour.com. Now, it's always nice to be able to play classic video games on new hardware. I mean, you know, us guys are generally real hardware kind of guys. I understand that not everyone is. Some people just want to be able to play games from back in the day on their modern PlayStation or the modern Xbox. And actually, it turns out there is going to be a really easy way to do this because AntStream Arcade is coming to the Xbox. Now, we've talked about AntStream before. I mean, for people that might not be familiar with it, it's basically like the... It's kind of the Netflix of retro gaming, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's like a game streaming service, but you also get a load of bonus features. So, like, one thing I... I've used it before, you know, you can play it for free, I think, and you can get a lifetime pass and stuff. I'm not sure if you can play it for free 
now, but um, there's not much on there for free. Yeah, I tried it this morning. It seems like they've really cut down the free selection. Ah, but okay, it's not that much. I think it's something like seventy nine ninety nine for like lifetime access. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I like is they have these like little challenges that they put out. Mm. So it would be like a certain level of a game or a certain section, and they'll put it out to the community, and they'll be like, right, who can do this and who can get the top score on that? And there's a whole high score system as well. So obviously, there's people on Antstream that are are fighting for those high scores and there's constant battles going on with titles, which is nice having it, you know, collaboratively online that uh, kind of adds an extra element than just sitting at home and playing the game. And there are a lot of these games that were originally like one player games or just couch co-op that now enables you to play online, you know, with friends, yeah. which I think is quite cool. You know, stuff like Bubble Bobble and uh, even like Pac-Man and things like that on there. And uh, yeah, you're right, they do these big tournaments, don't they? Because that was also a really big thing of gaming back then. I mean, the high score table, you know, everyone wanted to be top of the high score table in the arcades, didn't they? It was like the, the ultimate accolade to be number one on there. Yeah, yeah. And that, I love that kind of thing about it in the little kind of community because some of the challenges on certain levels are really tough. And they also make like little custom versions just for Anstream. Um, it's interesting to see. So, uh, you know, there was an emulation scene on the Xbox and I'm not very uh, up with the kind of latest one. I know that you had to put it into developer mode and kind of mess about with it and stuff. But this seems like a simple solution, a paid solution at that, though. Um, yeah. Uh, seeing how much it costs. I think it's for a lifetime pass. It's 17, seven, around 70 dollars. Yeah, like I said before, seventy nine ninety nine for lifetime, or you can pay twenty nine ninety nine for annual membership. So, in terms of cost, I mean, I think you know for the amount that you get on there, I mean, there's thirteen hundred retro games on there at the moment. So, I mean, you you pay eighty quid, and if that's lifetime access, and that covers you on not only your Xbox but also PC, Mac, Linux, Android, Android TV, Fire Stick, Samsung TVs, you can use web browsers on your computer as well. So, I think for people that you know haven't got the original games, I don't want to mess around with ROMs and setting up emulation. I think it's a good deal. I know um, Joe's got an Xbox, and I'm wondering, is this something that would appeal to you? Yeah, you know, you know, when I first saw this, so I saw the article on Radio Times, and it said, you know, 1,300 retro games are coming to Xbox, and some of these games are going to be PlayStation Nintendo games. First time these have ever been ported to Xbox. And I was like, wow, okay, what's this? And I clicked on it and I saw it as Anstream. And I was a bit like, oh, okay. Like it's got its pros and cons. Like I'm, I'm not too familiar with Anstream, but I thought it was going to be like, they're releasing 1300 retro games to the arcade, like, you know, to the, just the Xbox marketplace. Yeah. Like there's like, mm. you know, these thousand games are coming. I was like, wow, they're all going to be like two pound each or whatever. So in terms of price, it's probably a lot cheaper this way so that's great but what i'm curious and this is solely for me i'm a sucker for achievements and nobody really cares about achievements anymore but it drives me to play a game so i'm curious whether these games are gonna have achievements on the xbox and if they do it's gonna suck ah, me right so in. you mean integrated with the achievement system on the xbox yeah like, yeah so okay. i doubt it i don't I very I much doubt it because i've got a feeling it's going to be an app that just runs yeah on the I, xbox. I doubt it as well i think i think you're spot on there dan i think it's going to be an app but I think I'll, I will probably get it because of I'm a sucker for retro games on new hardware, as you guys know, it's convenient and stuff. And But it's just like the thought of being able to play through Mortal Kombat 2 and 3 and, you know, Earthworm Jim and stuff like that, all the Metal Slug games again, which, you know, they're already on there but, but on Xbox. But I just love the idea of being able to kind of like play them through again and have a goal of unlocking achievements and stuff rather than just completing it. And I, and I uh, guess but we'll this see. is uh, also reliant on being connected online, but um, I'm, I don't know how many people would actually play a modern console without being constantly <laughs> connected yeah. online. I think that's probably pretty uh, a small group of people, especially with all the blooming constant updates that you have to get on these systems, you know. It's kind of like I said before, I think, you know, I equate it to Netflix. I mean, I've seen some people you know, hardcore retro gamers on forums and Facebook groups being like, oh, you know, I'd rather play the originals or you can just set, set up your own little main box or whatever. Really, this is, you know, it's kind of what Netflix would be to a hardcore movie collector. Mm. You know, if you've got like, you know, all your favourite films on Blu-ray, you're not going to be that bothered about Netflix. But, you know, if you haven't got all that, then Netflix is for you. Same with this. I mean, if you haven't got like a, an original Mega Drive or an old Amiga or a Commodore 64 lying around or you haven't got a Raspberry Pi with all the ROMs and MAME and everything on there, this is for people that literally want to 
plug and play, isn't it? I, I don't know no if hassle. it's as bad as Netflix because Netflix always puts movies up and then removes them. Where I think a lot of these games are kind of they've been on there for a while and they're they're, they're mm. staying around, you know, um, which is good because uh, Netflix, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, <laughs> um, uh, depending on what rights and uh, you know things they've negotiated. Yeah, and I mean, I was looking through, I mean, it must be about six months since I last played with um, Antstream. And I did notice this morning, just playing with it for, for an hour or so, it does seem like there's a lot less on the free tier now. So I know they're kind of going down the, the ad-supported route for a bit, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, if that, I didn't get any ads this morning. It does seem like there are a few of the challenges you can play on there. But I think for that price, you know, for like 80 quid for access forever, um, there's definitely more on there than there used to be, you know, 1,300 retro games now. So I think price-wise, it's definitely decent value if... Uh, you know, you want a huge online library that's always available and, and then across your devices. If you've paid that once as well, you've got the account that you can use on everything. So you could use yeah. it on, you know, your your Mac, your Xbox, your, your phone on Google Play or whatever. So, you know, that, that can be used throughout, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, really simple way to uh, get a load of classics on your Xbox. So um, I'm not sure when that's launching, if it has already, but um, we'll keep an eye on that story for you. Uh, now, this is something that's very cool. Um, now, Theme Park by Bullfrog back in the day. Were you a fan of that game, Ravi? And I'm sure we talked Absolutely about Absolutely loved Park, it, yeah. We? Yeah, I um, recently had uh, Alex Trowers at a, a Kickstarter event, and um, uh, we talked to him on the interview. And, you know, coming out with a game that's uh, a bullfrog title but it's it's essentially a management sim you know back yeah. then that wasn't that kind of popular concept people were like hmm you know they weren't quite sure of it but i think theme park really made it fun and um you know you think doing stuff like increasing the kind of salt content so people go and drink more and then <laughs> uh, you know stuff like that wouldn't be fun <laughs> it sounds very boring but Actually, it's kind of good, and uh, I, lo- I love the whole idea of theme park. But seeing this on a uh, the Commodore sixty four is a a hell of an achievement, really. <laughs> well, this is not officially theme park, although it is in all but name. Um, obviously, to avoid copyright reasons, this is a game that's called Funfair Inc. Now, this is, I mean, looking at it, it is very, very. Very. It, it just looks theme like park. theme park. <laughs> like, yeah. At a glance, it plays like, exactly theme park. like theme park. <laughs> yeah. So it's um. This is really. I mean, if this had come out back in when did theme park come out? Ninety three, ninety four. Ninety four. Yeah. If this had come out on the Commodore sixty four back then, this would have been jaw dropping. So I remember playing. I never played the full theme park back in the day. I had it on a an Amiga format cover disc. They gave away like a a demo that you could play. I think it was like time limited, and um. Because I wasn't a big kind of strategy or management game kind of guy. I was more into arcade games. But I did actually get quite hooked on that demo because in the magazine they actually talked you through kind of how to do certain things and kind of walked you through it. So I did get quite hooked on that that one-level demo of Theme Park back in the early 90s. But even then I remember it coming out on other platforms like the PC and having the you know the 3D rendered roller coaster animations and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, there was um, uh, two versions for the Amiga as well. So there was a slower one and there was a faster, which had a few of the animations, but I do... Re- was that an AGA version, was it? Yeah, like and I do yeah. remember um, playing the PC version and like, oh my God, you can go on the roller coaster. And they're like, it was it was a lot more complete, definitely. And uh, for some weir- weird reason as well, it was um, sponsored by Midland Bank. Uh, <laughs> I remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I always found that, that section really... Uh, we had it on PC, we had it on Windows 95 and... I remember my brother showing us like, look, you can go on the haunted mansion, and look, you can go on the roller coaster and stuff, and it blown my mind. And then um, I always found it really strange when my brother would be hunched over the computer table, and they'd it'd be in a banker's meeting, you know, and it was the two hands, and they move closer and closer together, and then they shake hands. And I remember all <laughs> the logos, more for the loans bank. for more rides, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, this game looks so strange and boring, and then playing it, and like you say, Dan getting hooked on it but mm. i mean i would have been about six seven years old when we were playing that i could never get past the first like you buy a ghost train and a carousel and then my theme park would close down but <laughs> yeah this is incredible this funfair inc for the c64 you've got 32 rides on there as well as 20 shops and attractions that is insane to be from fair. what i'm seeing with the like demo and stuff they seem to have most of the actual features in there like yeah. m- mm. most of the options obviously They've got a very small section of the theme park that they're running and it, 
you know, with the C64's power, they've got so many like little characters in there that I can imagine it would get overwhelming. And uh, it was quite tough on theme park anyway, when you had lots of people in the park and, you know, being sick and running around and you had to have caretakers <laughs> and stuff like that. But I can imagine just the power of the C64. If this was a full, one of the really huge big parks, I can imagine it would, it would struggle. But from what I'm seeing here, it's incredibly impressive. And uh, you've got stuff like even the rides breaking down, which was one of the features where you had to get an engineer to come out. Um, you've got staffing cleaners and stuff. You haven't got as much details about like the attitudes of the staff and how they worked. And, you know, when you had the hiring process, you had stuff like that in the game. But um, the essentials are there for me, definitely. Yeah, and the amount of sprites they have on screen mm. as well with all the customers and the stuff and, you know, the, the rides breaking down, the flames, you know, with the, with the set of fire and things as well and the vehicles going by. And, you know, they've got the um, the user interface down the bottom, you know, point and click. I'm looking at this. I mean, it looks like it's joystick control at the moment. It would be nice if they could, because, I mean, you can use a mouse on the Commodore 64. It would be nice if that was implemented because it always feels like these games are a lot easier to play with a with a mouse and a joystick. Um, that's you know, just a little minor thing there, but I mean, yeah, this does look incredibly impressive and uh, pretty complete as well. I mean, if you want to go to, um, I'll link it up in the show notes up there, itch.io or itch.io um, site, you can download the preview of it now um, for free. It's a PRG file, so you can play that on um, your Commodore 64 with a, an SD card reader um, or write to a floppy disk. Um, no word on, you know, if or when it's going to be a finished game. Yeah, he's, he's, minute, he's basically saying uh, at the moment, you know, um, he's, he hit a brick wall with motivation yeah. uh, to do it. So um, he says... Unfortunately, unless I get in a position where I can do my own thing all day, every day, I don't see having uh, me having the time or energy to finish it. So um, it says the code will be available for anybody that wants to give it right. a go. So, you know, we'll see how this project goes. But um, he's, he's kind of set it up as a sandbox so people can play around with it and try and break it and, you know, have a bit of fun. But great that he's going to put the code out there as well. Yeah. I mean, it looks like he's done most of the hard work already. So, I mean, it would be great if, you know, you know, a few people can just kind of pick this up and finish it off. Because, uh, yeah, definitely one of the most impressive Commodore 64 games I think I've ever seen. So, uh, that's called Fun Fair. If you ever want to play uh, Theme Park, uh, but not Theme Park, of course, on your Commodore 64, that is available to download now. Now, just one final story before we hop into our chat with Eva Pasco. Um, we always love seeing these uh, new additions to the Game Boy, because there seems to be a lot of uh, hardware made for the Game Boy recently. But this is um, something new. This is a, a cartridge reader and writer device called the Burn Master. Yeah, this is by uh, Funny Play Inc. They're called, or just Funny Play Inc., but how their logo <laughs> reads is weird. Um, they've launched this this week, and it's a very cheap, legal alternative versions are kind of like downloading ROMs and stuff like that. So the full setup, it's a bit strange. It only costs $30, but it comes in like three pieces. So you can just buy the little kind of like cartridge slot reader, but then you can buy extra parts um, that kind of build it up to look a little bit like the bottom half of a Game Boy. Um, mm. And then you plug your cartridge into the top of it and it's got the D-pad, the A and B button, and then interestingly, a one inch OLED screen on there. But what it is for is for it is a cartridge reader. So you can download the ROMs from the games from official carts onto your PC. It lets you do, you know, a couple more things, you know, save your game data and stuff like that. Or interestingly, burn ROMs onto cartridges. So you can re re rewrite cartridges mm. or you can write onto you know, onto blank cartridges. So that was the most interesting bit for me. So basically you can make your own carts for yes. your Game Boy then. Yeah, essentially. Right. And there's a few of these things out there already, but this is just a cheaper alternative. And like I say, the full setup, $27, so under $30, but you don't have to buy that. You can just buy the cartridge reader for $20 and then it's another $4 and like another $3 on top of that if you want to have um, all the segments to kind of make it look, you know, the all singing, all dancing version. But yeah, interestingly, apparently you can play the games on the one-inch screen as well, um, which I don't fancy, to be honest, because the screen's at the bottom of the reader, so it's kind of like <laughs> underneath yeah. the buttons. I think it's um, the reason it's so cheap is because they've done it in this, like, you know, you buy the parts and you just clip mm -hmm. it all together. Yeah. And I, I first saw this and I thought, oh, does this require soldering or anything? But it doesn't look like it. You've just got a little screen that's displayed that you attach with the ribbon cable you've got the little battery pack and then you 
you clip it in and you have yeah. the, you know, D-pad and the other stuff as options and it's got a USB-C out. It's uh, quite a nice little solution. It's good to see this at uh, this price as well. Mm. Um, you know, and as you're saying, it's it's legal. And I guess when you're using the, the, the ROMs as well, you can play it on an emulator. So actually this could act as a, a system itself, you know, yeah. uh, saving your money if the, some of these systems are quite old. You can do that and you can also have saves on there and you can kind of play around with the data on the interface as well, which could could be really important for some people trying to back up their saves and stuff as, you know, a lot of the uh, watch batteries in these uh, could kind of go. It does look, um, yeah, the, the layout of it, it kind of seems a bit overkill having like the D-pad and stuff on there and the little screen, but, you know, I guess, you know, if they can include that for the price, why not? Um, like you said, the layout a little bit strange, isn't it? You kind of, your hands are going to be covering up that screen. Yeah. You think when, you, when you're there on the D-pad? Yeah. The article here on a Retro Dodo kind of says, can't imagine many people actually playing their Game Boy games on it. Yeah. Um, but I think if you... <laughs> that could be a challenge, though. It would be a challenge, but I think, you know, if you were like an indie dev and you were, you know, or, you know, you're kind of not so much a Kickstarter, I was going to say doing a Kickstarter for a Game Boy game, but say you've made a Game Boy game and you want 20 copies of it or something, you know, and you're willing to burn them yourself onto blank cartridges yeah. and sell them, I think this is a really handy tool to do that, you know, to download the game onto a blank ROM, burn it and stick your own label on there. Uh, download yeah. onto a I think for me that is one. kind of the, the big appeal of this, just being able to write your own carts that then other people can play on Game Boys, I think. You know, there's a lot of cartridge readers out there, we've covered a few of those before, but it is quite interesting to see something that kind of goes the other way as well, so you can put a ROM onto a physical cart, so um, yeah, for that price, I mean, it's a bit of a no-brainer really, isn't it? So if you want to read more about that, I'll of course link that up, and everything else we talk about, you don't have to Google around, I save you the effort, just check your podcast app or head to our website at theretrohour.com. Okay, this week's very special guest going inside the world of cyber cafes with Siberia co-founder Eva Pasco. She's coming up in just a minute. Before we do that, let's take a moment to give a big thank you to this episode's sponsor. And it's always nice to welcome our new sponsors to the show as well, particularly when they offer something as impressive as this. And this is our friends at Notion. Now, Notion, to kind of explain what this is, because, I mean, this is really powerful. It's a single space where you can think, you can write, you can plan, you can capture thoughts, you can manage projects, you can even run an entire company and do it exactly the way that you want to do it. Because, you know, we all work with different clients and, you know, we all have different jobs in the day and we do different things. And we all have to collaborate with teams. Just have a think, for example, I mean, you might be a good candidate for this, Joe, and I definitely am. Think about how many tools you're currently using your day job. Maybe how many different services you pay for each month and then trying to make these services talk to each other can be a nightmare. I mean, it could be, you know, maybe Google Docs and you've got your email and you have to sign into Microsoft Teams. You've got Dropbox, Trello, Discord, Figma. It goes on and on, doesn't it? There's so many you've got to keep track of. You're actually selling it to me as you speak, to be honest, because yeah. I'm thinking of my morning routine at work right now. And like you say, I log in and I open this app and then I open Teams. Then I have to open OneNote, which has got, you know, passwords and stuff like that on there, you know, and, you know, different kind of like this is how you log into this system and this is how you get into this system and all my different notes on there and then I have to then open this project that I've got going on and then I have to open you before I know it, I've got about 18 apps open whereas a uh, notion and all them notifications all those notifications all as well but a uh, notion kind of lets you put it all in one place and uh, it lets you kind of like nest pages into pages and makes you mm. lets you make your own clear pathways on there and then, you know, you can make it private or you can make it, you know, collaborative. So if you're just working on your own or you work with a team of a thousand people, you can kind of make it to how you how you need it to be, that dynamics there. Yeah, I mean, I've been using it for a couple of weeks now since they first reached out to us. And I've got to say, the technology in here, I mean, you look at it, like you said, the UI mm. is so simple, mm. but the power under the hood, I mean, whether you're working on, you know, it could be to-do lists, it could be for you personally or your team, your company goals, planners, product descriptions, marketing plans. You can embed images, videos, make gorgeous documents that you can even publish to the web if you want. It could be like your team Wikipedia in there, product roadmaps. And the thing about it is it goes beyond just documents as well. You can have databases in there. You can track deals. You can onboard employees, publish articles directly to the web. And the big thing that they've implemented recently is they've now got AI built in as well. So that's built into all of their tools on there. So that means, you know, across your notes, your documents, your planners, and you don't have to hop out to a separate tool because, I mean, 
I've used ChatGPT for about six months now. And normally I've got to hop out of like the, my email composer and hop into that and ask it to do something. But with Notion, it's all built in. So it automates all those tedious tasks that you've got to do in your day job while you focus on the things that you're good at. So it can help you with brainstorming, first drafts. It can even turn your messy brainstorm, which if you're anything like me, I often open documents and just try to you know, do a brain fart and just write loads of stuff in there. It can actually turn that into a polished, finished document at the click of a button. It can give you summaries from a bunch of documents and data, write client emails as well. So it's really simple to use and you can find everything within a couple of clicks as well. So if you want a calm, clear place to focus on the things that matter, honestly, Notion is an absolute game changer. And of course, because we're big fans of it, we've got you a great deal. You can try Notion AI for free. So head to this link, so we get the credit for sending you there as well. Obviously, it helps out the podcast, notion.com slash retro. All lowercase letters, notion.com slash retro, and try out the incredible power of Notion AI today. And of course, use our link, support the podcast, and try Notion AI right now at notion.com slash retro. And a big thank you to our friends at Notion for their support of our show. So next weekend, can't believe how quickly this month has gone by, patrons hang out coming up. Next Sunday, the 30th. We love the patrons hangout. Yeah. We talk about this all the time, but how much fun is a patrons hangout? Absolutely love it. You know, meeting new people, talking with old friends, showing off all the clobber that we've bought or inspiring each other to buy all the clobber and retro tech. It's absolutely amazing. And, you know, we've described it in the past of just kind of like a, a round table at the pub. You know, we all sometimes, we don't all do it, but, you know, crack open a tin of beer and stuff like that. It, I love it. I, I get excited for it every every month when it comes around. And now we're uh, a bit less busy as well. It's, it's it's quite good that we're going to be getting some of the patrons back on the show as well because mm. uh, we, yeah. we were doing that and having, you know, uh, patrons on uh, once a month. So hopefully we'll get back on schedule with that. And uh, I always enjoy hearing people's different stories and their journeys to, you know, how they got into computing. Yeah, 100%. So if you'd like to join us for our next Patrons Hangout that is coming up um, next weekend, and also if you uh, join us on Patreon, you get the normal podcast there early, if I can get it out in time. You get a longer episode as well, because we'll give you another two or three news stories. We chop all the adverts out of it too. And uh, also, if you join us as a gold member above, you get access to our bonus monthly podcast, of which we've now done 36 episodes of, and that is called the Retro Hour After Hours. And the latest episode could be the most controversial one to date, we talk about overrated video games. Yeah, that was a that was a tough one. <laughs> yeah, what, one or two kind of like you know, yeah, that's an obvious one, but definitely one or two um, shockers in there. I think all three. Uh, of I'm us still had a bit not of a talking to Dan. <laughs> 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 we see that there's been a bit of activity in the uh, the Discord this week. People go, "What? I can't believe you said that." And on the Patreon page, some people are agreeing though as well with that. A few of those controversial choices. So if you join us as a gold member above, you unlock that all 36 episodes as well. But really, the reason for joining us on Patreon is to help us keep the lights on and make sure that we can bring you the podcast each and every Friday. And we have some new members to induct into the most prestigious high score table. In the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. <laughs> and a big thank you to our latest members, Just Great Ideas. Dylan Sainsbury. And John Lundy. Who all backed us on Patreon over the last week. We massively appreciate your support. And if you'd like to do the same, all the details to join our wonderful Patreon community are at theretrohour.com. Okay, next, going inside the world of cyber cafes with our special guest, the co-founder of London's first cyber cafe, Siberia, Eva Pasco, is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest. And I'm so excited to hear some stories about the early days of the internet and the World Wide Web with our guest this week is actually an internet entrepreneur. Since the earliest days of the web, a key figure in introducing online shopping, also a futurist looking at retail, and actually was responsible for a lot of British people's first online experience as she co-founded London's first cyber cafe back in 1994 called Siberia. So let's welcome to the show Eva Pasco. Hello Eva. Hello Dan. Hi, welcome. Lovely to see you, to hear you and thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, taking up the invitation as well. It's um, you know, cyber cafes were definitely something of their time. Uh, you know, before we all got, you know, quick internet connections at home and everything. So it's going to be fascinating to hear some uh, some memories about Siberia, but I mean, kind of winding things back to day 1 because I know that you grew up in in Poland. So I wondered kind of how your 
upbringing influenced your career path and kind of what got you interested in technology originally? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. Now, I was born in Poland, sort of in the midst of the communism. And so, you know, that was in the middle of Cold War and arms race. So we pretty much lived in terror of nuclear disaster that was going to happen any minute now. And also surrounded by post-war poverty because, uh, you know, the country was completely mm. devastated after the war to very long time to rebuild it. Mm. So the communists were, were not very good on presence and the situation was dire. So we were very much brought up on the habit of looking up to sunny uplands, you know, the future. The future where it was all happening, where machines and technology will bring cybernetic communism to us all. So, you know, I was never particularly big on communism. My family was not into that a dictatorship, but I was very much into space travel and very much into intergalaxy tourism. I think I was about four when mm. moon landing happened. And, you know, I remember watching it. Isn't it weird? Uh, I remember every frame of that, of that uh, film that they were putting. Some people say that was probably a fake, but assuming it was true, <laughs> uh, I still remember it. And, you know, it was so inspiring. Everybody was absolutely assuming that by the time we're 20, in our 20s, we'll be hopping on to Mars for summer holiday. It just felt so much within our grasp, so achievable. Uh, and there was good evidence for that because, you know, we electrified Poland in about five years. So travel to Mars seemed like a walk in the park. So that was kind of my framework. And I also learned to distrust tech on the other side because, you know, at that time, uh, Poland was um, automating the agriculture. And my grandfather was a leather merchant. He supplied saddlers uh, for horses for agriculture. And, you know, suddenly in the period of about three years, the tractors arrived and horses disappeared. So basically the business collapsed, everything collapsed, and millions of people lost their jobs in a very short period of time because looking after horses was, was a big deal. And then suddenly the tractors didn't really need anybody, just a driver and, and one mechanic. Mm. So I was watching that and it was pretty catastrophic at the time. So it was kind of traumatic for me to remember it. So I always have this thing, yeah, great, but... <laughs> so. You know, I love tech, but I'm also very wary of tech. And, you know, it also was difficult for me because my father abandoned us when I was about five. My mother developed very severe mental health issues. We had zero money. So what can you do? I escaped into reading. I was absolutely devouring sci-fi. I read all Asimov, all Lamb by the time I was about 10. So by the time I was 12, I think I read everything. And I was super lucky because my brother-in-law was a sci-fi fan and had an enormous library quite often of things which were illegal in Poland at that time. So that was my escape route from the communist hell. And I somehow left indelible mark that I always was looking up into the future. I kind of, you know, my mindset was always the future. Well, um, talking of the future, wh wh when did you end up getting a, a home computer and um, wh were there any available under under the Soviet Union or, or did you have to get like clones? I know there were a few Spectrum clones later on. You know, oddly enough, there was quite a lot of computing because obviously Poland was a big exporter of arms. So the computing was there, but it was slightly different. It was it was basically somewhat alternative computing and not massively efficient, but it was there. But, you know, it was mainframes. So if you wanted something for home, that was really hard because we were under COCOM. It was a treaty that didn't allow manufacturers from the West to sell computers to Poland unless they were five-year-old. So, you know, if you were a young student and wanted to play games, you didn't really want a five-year-old computer. So we learned very quickly and early to make our own, to piece together from bits you could buy on local markets and just glue it together. And I remember when I came to UK, and I was very surprised that people couldn't put their computers together <laughs> because for me, it was like, obviously, that's how we get a computer. <laughs> but then I managed, I was very lucky. I was, um, uh, at that time, I was in Warsaw, I was studying linguistics and the linguistics started making little journeys into trying to do artificial intelligence, you know, the, how we create language, how we create, how we could recreate machines to speak, you know, that was the dream at that time. And uh, somehow we were given a compact computer. A friend of mine had a father in nuclear physics department and we got a compact. And that was really cute because I was based on IBM personal computer. 
It was about 16-bit desktop computer, computer run on Intel 8086 and 7.14 megahertz. So, you know, it wasn't much, but it worked. And we used to mess around for hours with basic programming, you know, Hello World, all this, and very early games. Um, but no Windows yet. So then when Windows came, I think in the desk for 386, and it shipped with Windows 2.1. That's where it's really started being fun. So, so yes, I was lucky that I landed uh, quite early on. I think I must have been around 19. So I never really was worried about computers because it became quite early part of, you know, everyday life. Well, when did you get interested in the world of online? I mean, um, were you dialing up bulletin boards before that? And how did you become aware of the World Wide Web? Uh, you know, very quickly when I came to university in UK in 86, I was very lucky. I came to a psychology department in Berber College, which is now part of London University. And it was just after Chernobyl. And people were super aware of interfaces, that Chernobyl was a failure of interface. You know, the, the operators couldn't see what the system was doing. So I was obsessed with saving the world from bad interfaces. And I was working on a PhD in a nuclear for nuclear power stations, this place. But it was still very much based on command line interfaces. You know, you had to, when you switch on the computer, it was dark blue. Yeah. Very mesmeric, but nothing on it. So we realized that if we wanted to take computers to non-engineers, it had to do a bit better than that. And then in, I think, April 93, Tim Berners-Lee came to give a talk and showed us Mosaic. I thought, okay, fine, we're done. That's it. That's the answer. <laughs> so very quickly, I abandoned my PhD and concluded that this needs to go out of universities and be used by normal people. And yeah, that was me. Hooked, for, hooked on internet forever. Was it um, hard to convince people about the internet and just explain the ideas of it and have people get it? Uh, it was very hard because back in the mid 90s, you know, the internet was around the universities and in the army, uh, but it only just got demilitarized. And people always thought that it was for underracks. Do you remember the term underrack? I remember even my yes, first, yeah. first video, my first instructional video was actually titled No Underrack Required because everyone <laughs> thought that it was for people, you know, in Max in the dark alleys. So it was quite a job to dig it out from there and make it more friendly to normal people. But I was very lucky. I managed to get together with uh, Janet Tier and uh, her husband Keith Tier and David Rowe. And we came up with this conclusion that it really needs to be put in a friendly environment so people lose that fear that this is for underworks only. And, you know, I was from Europe, so I used to spend all my, or misspent my youth in cafes debating forever how to bring communists down. And the cafes always came with coffee. And believe it or not, but in London at that time, which is mid-90s, people generally drank builder's tea if they drank anything, not, not beer. So there wasn't really many places, if at all, to get cappuccino in London. I was very frustrated with that. So eventually I got to my friends in Bar Italia and they sold us a second-hand Labazza cafe. And Siberia was the first place where you can have a nice cappuccino and a computer. So it was kind of a combo of a bit of a cultural revolution with the technological revolution. But we just make it, you know, good fun and invited lots of artists to paint frescoes, paint, um, use digital uh, technology, early Adobe, Dreamweaver to create a bit of digital artwork on the wall so people could feel more at ease with the computers. And that kind of did it, you know, people realized, ah, okay, so it's not analog, it's fine. And we had this beautiful um, furniture designed for us by Jeanne's sister, that it made it look a little bit sort of fantasy land. So we addressed the senses through the smell of coffee and the eyes for the visuals, and it was fine. And so uh, we- that's kind of, that's kind of really reflecting of like uh, Seattle as well, and uh, other places in America that were doing those kind of uh, internet cafe shops as well. W- were there any places that you based your model on? Well, not really, because remember, Americans were very late. We were first. So Siberia was the first internet cafe connected to the full internet. What the Americans were doing, they had America online and they had bulletin boards which were closed. They were not connected to the internet. So you could go to a laundromat in San Francisco and connect to another laundromat in San Francisco on the same bulletin board, but you couldn't serve the web. We were good, probably 18 months ahead of the game. 
Uh, so they were learning from us. We had endless visits. I taught CEO of Goldman Sachs how to send email because they only knew Lotus Notes. You know, they were all working with the closed systems because American online power was so strong that they didn't want to let open internet happen. And it took quite a long time. So we were, yeah, we were way ahead of the game. And you also uh, ran a HTML courses there. Uh, first, some of the first women-only courses as well, uh, trying to get them interested in technology. Um, what was that like, and how how did people take to it? Did they start creating their own sites and uh, you know building their own communities? Uh, you know that was a bit tricky because at that time on the internet you, there was a lot of games and there was a fair amount of. Uh, dodgy material but there wasn't really that much for women so we had to create content first and i was reading a lot of donna haraway sadie plant and hanging out with cyber feminists from australia and then we realized it has to go through art has to go for visual so we started working on i designed this course where i basically gave you a task design your own gallery online so collect the images that you like uh, we use louvre site we use the early museum sites and we also taught people how to use Photoshop and create a gallery. And once we opened that visual aspect, people loved it. And women were completely on board of it because, you know, they knew how to do it. They just, they, they just didn't really want to sit there and watch games. It wasn't their thing, but the art was their thing. And then music, of course, a lot of female musicians came. Well, going back to, you know, when, when you were setting it up, because, I mean, you were very early to the game, 1994. I mean, I only really just remember starting to read about the web in magazines around that time. And, you know, it seems so mysterious. So what were kind of the challenges you faced in setting up an internet cafe? I mean, it must have seemed like a, a really novel concept at the time. And how did you kind of overcome that? You know, the hard bit was actually getting the connection because at the time, um, internet was still very much into universities and nothing else. So if you wanted to get connection to the high street, we had to persuade few people to do it. So we started from BT. They didn't have a uh, product and were not really interested. And eventually we landed with Pipec, Pipex, which was very early internet provider for businesses. And they said, like, really? Do you want it for the high street? Why? <laughs> so we had to persuade them quite hard. But eventually we managed. So David Joe and Keith Tier founded EasyNet, which was the first internet provider for non-engineers. And they gave us the connection to Siberia. So technically that was solved. And then um, the problem was we couldn't pay the bills because initially Siberia was not profitable because if you can imagine, we were making coffee, money on coffee, but we had to replace the keyboards pretty much every week, all the keyboards, because people would spill coffee. They would put some cramps on it and nothing ever worked. So the cost of computing in the cafe was quite high. So eventually, I think we decided that we're not going to pay Pipex bill because we could, we had to pay wages and they came to cut me off. And you know who came was Bill Thompson, who then became my best friend. But on that day, I really hated him because he cut off the, our provision of the internet. How can you have an internet cafe by internet? Because we didn't pay the bill. Oh. So luckily, luckily, I was rescued by... Um, ingenuity of David Rowe and Keith and BT who managed to get the product for us, create a product for us in a day. And then we managed to get back online. But it was pretty hairy, I have to say. And then Bill became my very good friend and we're still friends. But I honestly, I didn't talk to him for about five years. So what was kind of the public's initial reaction to the idea of a, an internet cafe? And I imagine you must have had to give quite a lot of training to people who were sitting down and using the web for the first time who'd never used it before. How did you deal with that? I, you know, I was uh, quite lucky because during my PhD, I taught nurses how to use early NHS systems and, you know, they were really not interested. So I had to come up with some ways of, of doing that. And I came up with this um, design, which was a ho horseshoe shape where you have a bunch of computers facing each other and people sitting next to each other quite closely doing their own things, but seeing each other's screens. It was a little bit risky business because you can imagine a lot of people wanted to private things on the computers, but we decided that that was not going to happen. And when you put next to each other, people next to each other, they help each other. So if somebody got stuck, somebody next to them could help. And that's kind of how we got through the first few months. And then we were making a little bit more money. We designed this console of cyber hosts when we had people who were helping a little bit more like training. But, you know, by then the interfaces came, become easy and it was pretty intuitive. It's just that first year was really hard because my email, first email package was Eudora and that was a hell of an interface. So you really wanted to send that email 
to get through it. So it was a bit tough. But um, the easiest thing was to do with uh, music. You know, musicians were the first. And Mick Jagger was my early investor. And he brought quite a lot of people with him who were interested in what does it mean for musicians? How can they use it? How can they spread the word? How can they distribute the music? Um, and we were next to um, Whitfield Street uh, record studio, very large record studio, where Kylie Minogue and you two, lots of people were recording. So they would record and then pop into our place for uh, coffee and then learn how to send emails. And that's how it started. How, how was the uh, environment designed to foster collaboration and learning, uh, especially in those early days? You know, um, were people sitting around and kind of, being encouraged to talk? Uh, you know, it was very much a cafe. We had lovely tables, uh, chairs. We had the smell of coffee. You know, there's something about humans. When you put coffee on the table, people talk. And I knew that it was going to happen because I knew that from my caf- coffee shop's experience from Europe. And once you put coffee on the table, people start debate. And also, you know, remember that in that time, your friends were not online. Your normal friends were not online. So if you were a technology fanatic, as we were, you had to go and gather with the people who were of that ilk. And once you go to the cyber cafe, you knew you were with your people. That was your tribe. So people were quite happy to chat and help each other, swap stories, swap sites, where to get things, because, you know, there was no search engine. I think we wrote, we wrote the first search engine uh, just to help people out in the cafe. And honestly, there was maybe 50 sites on it. You know, that was all. So we had to kind of wait a little bit until things picked up. But eventually people started putting very various content that just attracted musicians, attracted game makers. For women, there was a lot of fashion and charities. A lot of early websites were charity sites for campaigning, which is still the case. We still support a lot of charity sites from campaigning. That's, a, that's the upside of the internet. Well, I know you've also been a big advocate for, you know, getting women involved in technology. And I did read that in that, you know, that era in 1994, less than 3% of internet users were women. So how did you kind of um, encourage them to come in and uh, nurture that inclusive environment in Siberia? Yes, it's it's hard to believe now because today in the online platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, something like 70% of time is taken by women. So completely swap the other way. But initially, it was quite tricky because even to install internet at home, even on EasyNet, which was the easiest of packages, it was still quite hairy. You know, the modem never worked. Things were not compatible with your password, with your Microsoft. It was a bit tricky. So unless you had somebody in the family who knew how to set up a computer, you really had to come to the cyber cafe. And I was very aware of that and was very excited that, you know, first experience of internet will be with us. And I felt very responsible to make sure that that was a good experience. So we were very careful to introduce people easily. And it was quite helpful that we had a lot of female musicians. So I had uh, girls who then went on to to compose and create bands who were our cyber hosts. So they were very, very quick and keen to show people how to source music and also how to upload your own music. Once people realized that this is not a one-way street, that you can upload your your material, your art, your music. But women were, were pretty quick. So, you know, it took a while, but probably by the second year, we were getting to maybe 50-50 ratio. It's it's interesting that you talk about music because um, you had an idea about embedding digital rights into the code uh, uh, that was used by Siberia Records. It, it seems like something like a early Spotify or, or, or one of those ideas. How did that work and come about? Uh, you know, musicians always complain about being ripped off by the recording studios, by the mm, uh, agents. So it's like nothing new about that. And they were complaining then there. And we created this um, solution with a wonderful French guy, Thibaut Jam, who is still in that space, and Keith Tier, which allowed the musicians to record their music and embed the digital rights track, the, the signs, the digital cryptography in the music. So so that was the business model that we kind of predicted it was going to happen. We were probably about five years too early with it. But, you know, then when when the musicians started getting really interested in how they can manage large scale releases online, they started coming back and using our documentation. So it wasn't the direction I was going to go, but I kind of regret it a bit because I could have been Spotify. Mm, way ahead of the curve there. No. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, Siberia was expanding really quickly around this time. I mean, you mentioned, you know, Siberia Records, and also you had the basement area that was dedicated to gaming. You had the second floor as a, a co-working room as well. So how did that evolution happen, and what kind of factors drove the expansion and what you decided to put in there? Uh, you know, it was kind of a combination of bottom-up and top-down. So remember, at that time, the political situation was changing, because the wall came down in Berlin, you know, everybody was very optimistic and we all thought that the history has finished and there will be peace forever. So people were very kind of on the up, on the up bit and they wanted to um, connect internationally. It was possible to travel to Eastern Europe without problem. It was possible to travel uh, far away, easier and easier. So we had a lot of people from Korea visiting. We had people from Japan. And, you know, they were big gamers. So the one thing we realized that for some cultures, it's not about chatting or downloading games. It's about online gaming. And the Koreans were particularly keen on that. So we started quite early on creating this den downstairs in Sub-Siberia, which had this big, beautiful arches. It was an old, old wine cellar. Um, so originally Ivan Pope had his first um, web studio there, but uh, then they moved out because they, they got successful contracts and then we used it for Sub-Siberia. So we created a beautiful tre- tres- frescoes online and invited the Doom community to start leading Doom games. And then onwards, like there was basically every game going and we opened up for the night. They were just having the space for the night and... Uh, created connections with people abroad and playing with people abroad. And that was really that sort of sense of internationalization where you kind of moved away from the concept of your country and more into concept of, you know, online futures. I think that's that was the most exciting part about it. Well, you received a lot of coverage on, you know, TV shows like uh, BBC's The Net and uh, magazines like .NET and Edge magazine as well. I mean, did it feel like there was a lot of excitement around the internet at that time culturally? Because I know for a lot of people, it just kind of seemed like it came out of nowhere. Then all of a sudden, like, you know, late 94, 95, it was suddenly making headlines all over the place. So did it feel like like there's a lot of excitement around it then? Yeah, it was incredible. You know, I ended up on the second page of Vogue somehow. It was so big. So we then ended up hosting Newsnight. I think I did three or four news nights uh, hosting question question time. So it was really big. And the, I think the reason was because we were so ahead of America. America was still in the depths of America Online, AOL, and they didn't realize what was out there. So a lot of American media came. It's like, how is it possible that the little place in London is ahead of the game? So I think that was a big, big factor in it, that we were first. And also we were opening the cafes at the very fast speed in big uh, metropolis. So we opened in Paris, in saint Pompidou. Uh, I was very lucky there because my architect, Bernard Blauel, managed to persuade Rogers and Piano to let us design completely different concept. It was very industrial, very sort of, you know, metal rock place, which was not quite in line with what Rogers and Piano were hoping for the saint Pompidou. But it was amazing. So a lot of French people came. Uh, then we went to uh, set up in Tokyo, in Roppongi, and in Bangkok, some Kumvit. So, you know, we had this network of like underground youth culture, youth movement, and everybody just wanted to connect and be international. So the press loved it. But, you know, there's more to it, I think, because if you cast back in mid 90s, UK was coming up with a terrible recession. You know, people are panicky by interest rates now. You know, when I started my first business, the interest rates were 15%. Wow. And by 1994, they were rapidly coming down to 8%. And people thought that that was really cheap. So it was it was beginning to be possible to get a loan for business before the banks would never loan anything. So there was a lot of entrepreneurial spirit about. And I think that was the exciting part. Well, um, you were even offered a, a kind of pioneering dating service as well, um, which was launched in 1994. How did that work? Oh my God, that was so exciting. But again, you know, that was because if you were online person, everybody else looked at you like you were slightly mad. So if you wanted an online romance, you had to find it in online spaces. So we wrote that with, with Timbo and Mike Rogers and I think Zoe Kamper, this lovely site called Recontre in French. Um, and you would put your favorite games, movies, your favorite computer types, your travel destinations, and it would match with a similar person. So we then even hosted a wedding on CUC Me, which was like a very, very early Zoom. 
I think it was about 1996, with the vicar was in Siberia, groom was in US, and the bride was in uh, France. <laughs> so people met, married, and the rest is history. Well, I mean, you mentioned before that you had some very famous visitors to Siberia, Kali Minogue, you two, David Bowie. I mean, have you got any memorable experiences of their visits? And how did these big stars react to the concept of an, an internet cafe and, and the technology? Uh, you know, very different, actually. Like Kaylee was recording in Whitfield Studios next to us, so she came for coffee. And nobody really noticed her because she's so tiny. Like, I don't know if you've seen her in real life, but she's absolutely tiny. Mm. So at some point, the, the I was in the cafe and the bar uh, tender said, I think she looks like somebody we might know. <laughs> so we went to touch up to her. She knew nothing at that time, but she said, you know, I really want to learn. So we taught her how to email, we told her how to FTP, and then she kindly gave us a very beautiful interview, which I have it in Siberia magazine, uh, which she started from, I want to be a nerd. So she basically wanted to learn how to run her business online because she's very, you know, she's a very good businesswoman. And she realized that that could be great for musicians, but she was absolutely lovely and started, you know, from zero to reasonably good level in probably a couple of days. So that was a great experience. And then we we work with many people. We taught Gary Barlow, U2, Bono, um, Jagger brought quite few people. And obviously David Bowie, who was quite ahead of the game because he had his own internet provider called Bowie Net. Mm. So we did a big interview with him, like all-nighter interview, uh, one Saturday night when he would just talk about his ideas for the internet for the future. And he was very forward thinking because he was the first to start talking about Letting people sample the music. You know, he was quite excited about it. He wasn't about closing it down. He was very much into opening it up. Uh, so I was very inspired by him. And I think he he would have been very happy to see what's happening with AI and how you can sample music even better. So that, that yeah, that was really interesting. And then the younger musicians uh, started running graves uh, using a lot of technology to run um, raves remotely and in very strange places in London and they ended up coming to us on after the raves on Sunday early morning and they just we, we had this famous breakfast raves that carried on pretty much for the whole Sunday. As you continue leaving the club, you just went to Siberia and then they carried on. We we were led by a very very interesting guy, uh, Jonathan, who was a DJ from 70s. So he was the veteran of Ibiza, Goa, you know, the early hippie movement. And he then was helping people to fight the criminalization of rave because that happened in 1994. Mm. And we supported them with ISDN lines, with generators to sort of fight John Major authoritarian decision to ban rave music. So, yeah, good times. So did you start to see a kind of a, a change in the base of guests and like the diversity? Did you start to see like stockbrokers in there and uh, other people as well as not just the kind of cyberpunk um, geeks? Yes, I would say it went sort of mainstream in about three years. You know, it's a little bit like when people talk about punk music. It, in London, it lasted about two years and then it went mainstream. And I think in some way the the cyber culture was, was about three to four years and then it became mainstream because it was so incredibly useful that you wouldn't really want to keep it niche. So maybe not stockbrokers because, you know, they were busy, but I would say by about 96, 97, you definitely could see why the group of people, but also more women who looked at the web to create their own stuff. You know, they wanted to break out of the control of the publishers because bear in mind that till mid 90s unless you got a publishing deal your voice would not be heard and the publishing companies were on 90 percent controlled by men so it was a very specific type of book selection that was going on and suddenly online you got the voice for the price of online hosting and a little bit of learning of how to make a website you could say things and I think that was the incredible thing. People people found their voices and they found the multiplicity of voices. I'm sort of with mask of that, that you have to let the truth come out. And that was the moment where everybody started getting interested in publishing. And I think that was the time when it went mainstream. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned those HTML courses as well. I mean, we uh, were people publishing things on, you know, platforms like GeoCities and AngelFire. We, were you kind of helping them with that in, in the cafe? 
Well, we had our own uh, online Siberia bulletin, uh, and then we were supporting people who wanted that sort of online space for their communities, particularly charities or, you know, campaigners. So that need to gather together online was pretty clear. But it was also pretty clear that you had to moderate it. And I was actually, I have to say, I was pretty shocked when I realized that Facebook decided not to moderate and just let people read. Because like, if you kept it to UK, the tone of voice online was pretty mild and pretty, you know, people are incredibly polite in, in England. Uh, in, in Britain. But the problem was that Americans were not. Americans' online culture was very aggressive, very much in your face, very conflictual. And this did not really went, but well, it was very difficult to manage. And I think the the lessons from for me was that I didn't want to get involved in that because I didn't want to be a moderator. I rather supported someone who wants to be moderator. Like mm-hmm. uh, we work with a New York community called um, Echo, uh, and they had, for a community of 2,000, they had 200 moderators. So can you imagine the ratio of moderation that you need to keep the community, you know, civilized? Yeah. Uh, we didn't think that that was a viable business model, so we didn't go for it. Um, and I think lessons learned that, you know, online people, unfortunately, even if you put your name on it, people could be a bit mad. So I did yeah, I didn't want to go that way. We went into a slightly different way. I went into payments. So, you know, when we were in the cafe, we were always short of change because people would pay £3.50 for half an hour email, which was great, but uh, I always had to give change and I never had this. So eventually we got fed up with it and we asked Kift here and Thibaut to write us um, online payment so people could pay with the credit card. I was a little bit dubious if they will because it was still, you know, nobody really had online payments then. But uh, we knew that internet bookshop was already working and taking money. And there was already sort of like early days for the secure socket layer. Mm. I thought, okay, let's go for it. So we did it. And you know what? It worked. So I thought, okay, interesting. People trust the computer enough to give it credit card. So that became my thing. I thought, okay, so what else can we put online that we can sell remotely rather than having the shops online? Because, you know, shops shops physically are very ineffective. Mm. Uh, they're basically a bunch of little warehouses and you always take things there and take them out and it's just not very efficient. So I thought that online shopping would be more efficient and that was my direction. I'm interested to hear a bit more about the franchising it as well because, I mean, you mentioned before that you had cafes in here, Tokyo and there's Paris, Manchester as well, I heard, and Rotterdam. I mean, were there many more of these? And how did that kind of franchise rollout happen? Did you have like a a set set of things they had to follow? Did you go and do site visits? How did that kind of work? Oh, yes, that was very exciting. So my partner, Jeanne Thier, was uh, queen of franchises. <laughs> so she developed that concept of manual. Uh, and it was quite, yeah, it was very successful. We rolled out in Paris. Uh, the, the fun one was Rotterdam because that was with uh, Richard Branson. He was opening a Virgin Megastore in Rotterdam, which is a fantastic place, not least for music. So he gave us a huge space and we worked very closely with the Virgin team to incorporate and maintain our Siberia, you know, alternative spirit in in his music space. Uh, And it was good fun, actually. I met him quite a few times there and I learned how they roll out. I mean, Virgin is basically, it was all franchise. They, they, he doesn't like spending money. He always takes somebody else's money. (laughs) So he just gives them manuals. So we kind of picked it from there. Uh, and we then met an amazing franchisee in Japan. He was this lovely Japanese guy who was trained as a chef in Paris and became Michelin chef and wanted to add Siberias to his empire. And it was just so much fun because, you know, in Tokyo, if they don't like the building, they just take it down. So he took mm. down one building, built it up back in Siberia and created this beautiful four floor cyberspace, you know, very Blade Runner-ish, kind of very Blade Runner aesthetic, but it was so fun. Um, yeah, so we, we grew that way because, you know, we grew very fast. So once the genie was out of the bottle, everybody wanted to have Siberia on the streets. Everybody wanted to be walking distance to Siberia because it was still hard to put together the modem at home. You know, it was still hard to keep your line up. It was still hard to get through the sign-up system. So people relied on the internet cafes for a good 10 years. You know, I remember I thought that this business is only for a year because surely... By 1996, everybody will have a laptop. You know, I was completely convinced on it. 
And then look, there is still Cyber Cafe on my street now. So I think the the journey, there is always a space for high street for a little bit of a computer thing. And that's how people like being introduced to technology. I think they probably will need one now for the AI because everybody's talking about it. But most probably have no idea what it is. So you could easily mm. imagine AI cafe. I, I kind of like the uh, cottage industry vibe of it because it, in the UK we had a like some of the early computers, Lion's Tea, they, they ended up making the home automated office and their whole own computer. Was, was that one of the uh, kind of most challenging aspects, having to do a lot of stuff yourself? Uh, yes, but, you know, we were based very close to Tottenham Court Road. And for those who remember, Tottenham Court Road was the biggest technology street in Europe. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a piece of kit you couldn't buy there. And it was extremely knowledgeable bunch of people. You know, every shop was staffed by techno enthusiasts. And it was like just a massive repowering of technology for joint knowledge in those shops. So if if I needed anything, I would just walk down the street and I would get it. And I would get a lot of help with installing it. So that was really quite lucky because we didn't realize that at the beginning that that backup was there. We ended up choosing Whitfield Street because it was very close to my university. I could walk there during my break. I was still doing my PhD. I didn't think it was going to work commercially. So it was a little bit coincidence. And then we discovered that, right, we are next to the biggest computer street in the in Europe. Hey. And that made a lot of things a lot easier. I mean looking back on the you know the four years that you were there, I mean were there any kind of other significant events or, or big turning points for Siberia that kind of stand out in your memory? Uh, you know, a lot of events were to do with politics because it was a very strange political time. It was the, the Tories were kind of on their last legs and then the new Labour came in. So we hosted quite a lot of Labour fundraising parties, uh, with uh, including uh, people who then went to work with Tony Blair uh, and supported that change, you know, as hard as we could because Tory dictatorship, as it was there, was very unpleasant. It was very unpleasant for technologists because they kept banning things. Uh, yeah. But I think the big things I remember was uh, the online, the big online connections. You know, we used to do these festivals where... We would start in Tokyo, have musicians in Tokyo, live streaming. Then we would pick it up from London and then we would hand over to New York and they would hand over to San Francisco. So you had this sort of like 24-hour live music events, which kind of we still continue. We, we run something called Arts Birthdays on, in January every year. And so uh, we basically run like a big sonic event where people just, everybody in every time zone does an hour of live music. So that sort of was the opening of the true international um, experience of real time music and real time events. How do you feel that uh, Siberia contributed to the um, broader digital revolution in the UK? You know, I think we just trained a lot of people. I personally must have trained trained probably five to six thousand people on my HTML courses, and we also developed uh, a little bit of investment support for uh, web agencies. So, for at some point, every little web agency in London had somebody who was trained at Siberia. So, you know, from Razorfish, Tomato, like amazing agencies that went on then to do fantastic things and sold for a lot of money. They all came from us. Uh, so we probably accelerated the rollout for in London and in UK for probably two, three years. It would have happened anyway, but it would have taken a lot longer. The fact that you had access to um, knowledge, to data hosting, to ability to advise on creative. I mean, we had all service, you know, from, from zero to hero in one place. So that just made life a lot easier. And there was a few other cafes after us that supported that as well. And it was a very open culture, you know, all the software of open source. So the knowledge spread fast. It was, and also, you know, I remember we were coming out of Microsoft era, Microsoft prison, as we called it, because before us, if you wanted to do things online, if you wanted to be a developer, you had to work for Microsoft. There wasn't anything else going. So people were so frustrated, so incredibly angry and fed up that when it opened up and you could do your own things online because it was all open source, like, whoa, go. And I think that enthusiasm speeded up the development. Did you um, decide to go with 
Netscape instead of Internet Explorer then as your browser of choice in the cafe. Yeah, yeah, we well, we started yeah. with Mosaic and you yeah, know, yeah. and then then Netsuite, Netscape. But it was a little bit raw piece. I have to say that <laughs> when when things go, gone more commercial, life was a little bit easier because open source is great, but you know it's very buggy. Mm. So for the for the public space, you really want to have something a little bit more sturdy. Well, you left in 1998. How had things kind of changed by that point and why did you take the decision to move on? Uh, you know, we were uh, looking at what was happening in the market and we were always considering this to be quite temporary business. And so uh, by then, uh, Easy Everything and the guy from EasyNet, EasyJet, decided to launch this big cafes with 400 computers and he completely misprised them. So he priced them like, I don't know, 50p per hour. And I knew that it wasn't going to work because just the cost of replacing keyboards was higher. So I think he managed to dump like, you know, 20 million pounds into that and completely failed. But I didn't want to go down with him. So we knew that he was going to ruin the business for himself. And we were concerned that he will ruin the business for everybody else. So we found the partnerships with a um, Korean company. Uh, who were very big on e-gaming. And we didn't particularly want to do that because e-gaming in UK went a different way. You know, people game from home. While in Korea, I don't know if you know, but it's a little bit frowned upon if you meet girls in public, but it's okay to meet them inside in the gaming cafes. So it was just a way of young people being together. So we sort of exited to them. And then I offered uh, to build um, e-commerce, a first stop shop for Arcadia. And worked with uh, as a joint venture uh, managing director for Daily Mail and Arcadia, creating all the online properties for them. So Topshop, um, Dorothy Perkins, and also a little bit of Daily Mail online. This is money. So working with Mark Sillenberg there. So that was quite fun. I basically went into online publishing. I wasn't that big on retail, which is kind of probably explainable because physical retail, you know, when I ran Siberia, it wasn't a night when the alarm wouldn't off at four in the morning or someone would break the window or something. And I was like, mm. you're constantly living on the edge of edges with retail. I feel like, oh, can I just do it online? So at least, you know, if something goes wrong, it's just a server. It's interesting as well, because I mean, around that time, you know, in kind of the, the dot-com boom, if you like, I remember some, you know, famous examples of uh, money kind of being, you know, wasted, like Boo.com would have been a famous example of a, an early online retailer where things went very wrong. I mean, what were some of the challenges and, and the successes you experienced when setting up e-commerce for like companies like Topshop in that era? Uh, you know, the biggest problem was technology because uh, bear in mind that at that time, the big retail was all running on mainframes and on batch systems. So everything was updated after the shop has closed and it didn't need to be in real time because the shop's only open for a few hours per day. So when we showed up and I wanted to run an online store, which you know needed to be 24 by seven, they look at me like, why? Because <laughs> you can't close it down, it has to be always open. So we had to create completely different infrastructure. So we went to ICL and work with them on creating basically a real-time online shop, which uh, which took quite a while because there was no infrastructure at all available. We were the first online shop um, in UK for fashion by about five years. I think I think Tesco came about five years after us. So it was everything from scratch, including the cybersecurity solutions, the the safety of payments. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, Arcadia staff was amazing and I made incredible friends there. The CEO then was American, John Horner. And I mean, honestly, he was number 0007 on CompuServe. That, that's how wow, cool he was. <laughs> so he was this amazing, super passionate guy who, you know, made it all happen and helped us out. And I still work with people like Richard Sims and Chris Ingham from that time because they were very, very good retailers. Uh, unfortunately, sooner or later, you know, all good things come to end and um, Philip Green came, uh, took over the business, completely ruined it. So I exited it a few years later. But, you know, the beginning was great. It was good, good few years of amazing fun. Well, uh, back in 1999, you predicted uh, that mobile phones would be used for browsing going on, uh, daily commutes and uh, kind of shopping. Um that prediction's definitely come true, um, but uh, not many people saw the connection then. Um, wh what was your thinking behind this prediction, and uh, how did you see the technology evolve? 
You know, my main thinking was time because we were getting more and more busy and everybody had, you know, because it was still just coming out of this uh, recession. Everybody had two jobs or three jobs. And the women loved shopping, but, you know, we were all busy, particularly if you had young kids. And I'm thinking like, yes, I love to shop, but I just haven't got the time. So if we can buy things on the mobile as we commute on the bus, you know, as you wait for bus, wouldn't it be crazy? Wouldn't it be wonderful to save so much time? So then, you know, you can take the kids to the park as opposed to be forced to shop. So I was hoping that the food companies will follow because my biggest fear was spending, you know, that hour extra of my life in Sainsbury is trudging around with trolley. It's like, why would one to do that? So I wanted to solve my problems. And at that time, it was a little bit tricky because we had only WAP technology and that mm. wasn't robust. You couldn't really do that much on it. And I think that's why a lot of people couldn't quite imagine that it would get better. But, you know, I've been through the technology route and I've seen that if you put the question to technologies, they will answer. If you formulate what you want, they will provide. So if we want an online shop on a mobile, I knew that somebody was going to answer that. So, you know, we carried on with WAP. I honestly, I had WAP shopping for Topshop about three years for those who were of that ilk. But as the other people were watching and as they were looking at the take, I was like, mm, you know, WAP is probably not the way to go, but mobile was proven to be the right thing. And I kept arguing with a lot of very famous people who just couldn't see it. Even famous technologists couldn't see it. Said, no, nobody's going to spend time on mobile. But I had this gut feeling that it's all about saving time. And that luckily I was right. Yeah, and uh, WAP, like the payment systems weren't really that well developed and stuff by then. Uh, you know, it was it was early days. But uh, yeah, definitely it's uh, it's hit the mainstream now for sure, especially after COVID as well. I know it's a lot of people have uh, started shopping online. Well, I mean, a lot of people had to go you do their homework on it. You know, that was the, the, the more difficult thing when we were trying to prepare laptops for kids who were stuck at home without internet during COVID. And then I realized that, you know, there isn't enough laptops for everybody. And we work with teachers to develop lessons for smartphones, basically. That's how a lot of kids went through COVID. We should have sorted it out before and we should have put, you know, laptop for every kid policy in place before, but who knew? Hopefully we can do it now. I mean, going back to Siberia, in recent years, you've been documenting more of your memories and other people's as well on YouTube. So where did the idea to kind of start recording these stories come from? And uh, can you tell us a bit more about kind of how you did it? Uh, you know, my key point was that it's easier to understand technology if you take a bit longer perspective. So, you know, tech is like like this sort of seductress. It drags you in and it it amazes you with what's in front of it. But you really have to look a bit further so you don't make mistakes. And one thing that we have seen from the beginning is how, you know, technology is not neutral. And we just wanted to retain that knowledge that technology is a weapon, is developed with money that quite often has not necessarily the best of intentions and as much as I love it, I'm very, very skeptical of technology being rolled out for good. It, te- it generally is rolled out for not so good. So we wanted to retain the knowledge and the recollections of people who were at it at the beginning and who can tell the stories how tech was used well and not so well, so we can learn from that. I'm actually quite concerned, to be honest, with what's happening at the moment, because, you know, AI... Uh, as much as we love it and it's great fun to play and create pictures and so you know faff on mid journey um, the people who develop it they don't really know how it works you know I heard some old man not once or twice saying that it got better when it got bigger it got more intelligent when it got bigger and it's like mate do you know what you're doing there because <laughs> you know mm. it could be nuclear disaster we wouldn't even know is there so I think some way is it's just really to retain the memory of how good and also how dangerous technology can be because we get seduced by it you know it's mesmerizing we just fall in head in dive in and then we wake up with you know like in Sri Lanka people being dead because Facebook amplified you know hate inciting comments and only then say oops sorry we didn't mean it so like we just don't want this oops sorry we want to have a little bit more intelligence and pass on you know the elders experiences because we made lots of mistakes but we hopefully can learn from them so i think that was kind of the the basic idea 
And I'll put a link to your YouTube channel if people want to hear more about those stories because, I mean, yeah, they're fascinating. And it, like we mentioned, you know, before we started recording, it's how important it is to get this stuff documented, you know, for future generations so people can hear where it all came from. And um, you also mentioned before that, you know, you've got a cyber cafe on your street. There are a couple of them dotted around Nottingham as well, mainly gaming cafes, really. But And you mentioned about, you know, the idea of maybe an AI cafe. I mean, do you think there's a place for a concept maybe on the scale of Siberia in today's technology landscape? Larry, you know, I think there is so much empty space on the high street at the moment that it wouldn't do any harm to have AI cafe or maybe smart health cafe. You know, like everybody should really be using wearables and wear them for their health because it definitely helps. I I work with a couple of wearable companies and it absolutely revolutionized my health routine. But, you know, people don't really seek it. So if you bring it in the cafe and use it for, it's a great education medium. And when you look at the high street, like every other shop is empty. So we just as well can use it for something educational, useful and introduce people to good, healthy tech. Um, in a nice environment. Yes, yeah, so I'm all for it because, you know, there is space. Um, I, I've been traveling a lot and going around the world to developing countries. You see uh, cyber cafes are still massively huge there and, uh, you know, a very important resource for people. Oh, yes, definitely. If you go to Latin America, Africa, and you don't even have good to go that far in Eastern Europe, you know, a lot of people still don't have connections from home. So, yeah, they will carry on for sure. Well, Eva, it's been incredible hearing some of your memories about Siberia, you know, the first cyber cafe, and uh, it's just such an interesting era. And um, the fact that, you know, all this has happened in just a couple of decades, you know, how far we've come since then. So it's been so nice to reminisce with you. And thank you for coming on and sharing your uh, your memories with us. I mean, what are you up to these days? Because I know you mentioned before that you, you've actually you've wrote, wrote books recently as well. I mean, tell us a bit more about what you're doing now. Uh, well, I've got a couple of projects. So I've uh, just had a book out with an uh, anthology of short sci-fi stories. They're a little bit Black Mirror-ish, but in a maybe slightly more positive outcome. You know, kind of reflecting on what the new tech can do and alternative futures. So we're a little bit more prepared for what's coming uh, because we always get caught and then get surprised that things happen to us as opposed to driving tech. I particularly want to in- increase number of women writing sci-fi stories because that that voice and the experience um, it's is badly needed. You know, we don't want to be in the receiving end on the visionary. We want to be the visionaries as well. Uh, and the second project, you know, I started, I've rebuilt the Siberia in VR. So we've got a very lovely Siberia in virtual reality and we're hosting events in it, music events, live streaming, book launches. So we're sort of sl- slightly mm, moving to beyond 2D to 3D uh, because I think everybody is sick and tired of Zoom and they would massively benefit of having opportunity for everybody to to experience virtual places and it was quite fun rebuilding it i work with a pcm creative agency from uh, nottingham actually uh, on recreating it so based on the actual siberia so i've got to show you after the uh, show because it's so much fun when people come to the virtual siberia who actually came in the physical siberia they immediately get it. And, you know, the psychological moment of reveal is just so quick. And people who've never been to Siberia before say, oh, that's what it looked. So it's just great fun. So I'm going to develop that a little bit more. And I'm working with Shopify on virtual shopping because I've done, I brought Shopify to UK about 10 years ago. And now we're sort of looking at expanding that to the next uh, stage of virtual shopping because I think physical shopping is not going to be happening on the high street it's really the high street will be the wellness street where we do things for wellness you know massage pedicure but the actual physical shopping for physical goods will be done in virtual reality well it just feels like that's the natural evolution of Siberia to eventually end up in cyberspace itself (laughs) how how do people get access to that then is is it open for people to Uh, well we run it on events basis but it's in on spatial IO and we have a number of environments you know we can teleport from the foyer to the Siberia then to galleries so we're building a little little kind of equivalent of Whitfield Street Corner just behind Tottenham Road Road. and hopefully I can recreate a little bit more of that and remind people how Tottenham Court Road was the biggest tech street in Europe. Oh, that sounds incredible. We'll definitely keep an eye out for that, Eva, and I'll, I'll obviously link up your, your books in our show notes as well uh, if people want to check those out. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Wonderful. It's been my pleasure. 